Yeah, it's good to be here. I arrived just in time to give this talk, so happy for Mobile Mom Day's uh, schedule here. Um, I'm going to, I also, uh, Nick set me up well because I think what I'm going to talk about today are some applications for just the types of opportunities that he started to outline. And I kind of wore several hats at patients like me in general doing experience design and user research. So I'm primarily going to talk about that and also talk to you a little bit about the business model at patients like me. But primarily I'm going to talk to you about the opportunity of people who are dealing with their health and, and how they've um, taken advantage and learned from becoming kind of investigators in their own health, proactive patients. So typically a patient is, when someone gets sick you go to the doctor and traditionally that medicine is delivered sort of top down in some sort of patriarchal fashion. But in reality, if someone's living with any type of chronic or serious condition, they have to manage that condition every day. They have to reason about their daily activities. They have to make behavioral changes that are appropriate for them. They have to be motivated to do so. So how do we kind of understand the disconnect between that traditional healthcare system and this reality? And partially because we're here and I have one of those gadgets in my pocket, you know, what are the opportunities now that we are not only sort of these passive recipients, but we are possibly the sort of the investigators, the scientists into our own health. And these gadgets aren't just obviously phones. We have all these kinds of different sensor technologies built into our smartphones and, and, and possibly into our home environments as we proceed. So what I was going to talk to you today about is the opportunity that affords us when all of a sudden we have a very rich data landscape that patients can record information throughout their day. How are we going to take this data, collect it, aggregate it, and use it, reflect it back to patients for their own personal awareness, and create new knowledge? And that's what we've tried to do at Patients Like Me. So I first got interested um, so I'll talk to you about some case examples from patients and then sort of the opportunities for researchers and industry and what we've done at the company in that vein. I got into this early on in when I was still studying. I was interested in education and, and behavioral medicine and namely like how people can get more creative and generative in their health care. You know, it's not all burden. How do we actually find some something proactive and creative in this process. And so I worked with people with diabetes and I gave them cameras and we were working with their glucose monitors. We were trying to understand like how could people collect easily behavioral data which they could then use in reasoning about their daily life. And we worked with different communities of patients. And sure enough, people sort of reported back to me that they became more aware of their options. They started to see that they had choices in their environment that they could actually, using this kind of camera, they could sort of take a step back and observe their behavior and make more conscious decisions about it. So I was really excited when sort of many years later I started getting involved in patients like me, which was a community, a uh, small company at the time that was very patient-centered and was really intent on understanding what can patients how can their expertise, their reasoning, lead to new knowledge for one another and also for research and sort of the greater medical knowledge base. So the platform is a space where patients explicitly choose to share very personal data about what they do each day, what treatments they take, what symptoms they have, what their side effects are. And they can use this information to find other patients in the same kind of situation, going through the same types of issues. And we aggregate all that data so that patients can learn from these experiences of one another. So let me walk you through that. A member would come to our site and she would add some very structured data about her pain or fatigue, depending on what she has, we create different types of surveys to record appropriate information. This creates a, a her personal profile, a very graphic profile of her health over time, so she can reflect upon that herself. 
but it's also aggregated to see lists of different people in those situations and sort of treatment symptom reports that are all kind of interlinked so you can go talk to anyone on any treatment or experiencing a symptom and so forth. And it's also linked to your care. So you can use these visualizations to go to your doctor and sort of bring this data into that clinical conversation. We launched a few years ago and we have 50,000 patients across now. It's nine plus one very new epilepsy community. And these are sort of small numbers, but we're not going for huge populations. We're going for groups of people who want and are interested in sharing this data. So we don't need huge numbers to get sort of meaningful um, sort of evidence-based numbers on clinical results. So I just wanted to sort of think about a mobile app a uh, question that's on our site that would lend itself to a mobile application, although it's currently you know, web-based. It's just, how are you feeling? And a doctor might ask you this periodically, and you might respond just in that moment of how you are doing. And that might, you know, you would pick the response category that was appropriate to you. And you might get the most natural way to display this would be over time. So on our site, a mood patient, this would be part of the profile and kind of see over time, blue is good, oranges are bad, and you kind of see, oh, they're doing a little worse than they are better. And when we start, you know, one of my interests is also data visualization. How do people give this, how do you help people make meaning out of this information? How do you make that into some kind of knowledge? So you could explore your data, and this person, this is by time of day or day of week, you could see they're actually pretty level. The distributions are pretty even for each, say, day of the week. And you could, this person compare themselves to someone else who notes that like, they happen to go through this sort of cyclical thing where towards the end of the week they feel better, but they always sort of go through some lull at the beginning of the week. So how do you take these momentary pieces of data and make them into information so that people can reflect upon them and try to make some adjustments accordingly? So for another one, say fibromyalgia, we use different kinds of measures. We use surveys that are um, clinically validated to gauge things that are appropriate for fibromyalgia, like pain and fatigue and so forth. And this is one woman's profile. And she remarked that as she started to look at these charts in conjunction with each other and follow certain things, like she started, chose herself to start following her menstrual cycle and see how these different um, pain and fatigue scales related to that pattern. And she started to see these patterns. She actually did some pretty sophisticated judgments and saw these patterns and relationships brought to her doctor, said, look, it's sort of evidence-based medicine on a personal level, and said, look what's happening to me. I can sort of prove it. And she got her treatments adjusted accordingly. So we see that on the site in a variety of ways. Then I also wanted to share an example of how individual patients are benefiting from sort of the group experience. So this is an example of someone doing research on a treatment. Um, he wanted to find a new drug that wouldn't have strong side effects, like a narcotic. So basically, he goes and looks at what other people, uh, who's taking this other drug that he's interested in. He sees why they're taking it, see if it aligns with what he is interested in treating. He can go to these treatment reports and see the efficacy that people ascribe to it, which in this case, about over half of people say it worked pretty well. And more importantly, the side effects, which most people said were fine, only like 30, you know, most, only 7% said they were severe. So it seemed better than the drug he was on. And then you can go and discuss those side effects with anyone on the site who's reporting them or anyone else on the drug. So I'm just sort of, we also did some surveys that resonate with those anecdotal findings too. And a lot of the payoffs for patients seem to be around symptom management and also about just things like naming the symptoms are very helpful. So people just the act of recording and, and giving meaning to these symptoms has some therapeutic effect. Another thing I just wanted to highlight was that people feel more comfortable ex discussing things that are very sensitive on our site than they do in either, you know, other kinds of forums. And this means that we might be getting richer types of data than you would be getting in a clinical trial in a doctor's office. 
And all of a sudden, you have this data that we can then work with. So what does this mean for our clients, our, our industry? Well, all of a sudden, if a, an, if a drug manufacturer has a question about medications, you have a whole new type of data set. Clinical trials may have be appropriate to evaluate certain aspects of the drug, like efficacy against a control or some other therapeutic agent. But there's a whole other level of side effect data, which is often lost. So we, this is one example of a new finding came out that some antidepressants may have sexual side effects that were not previously reported. So we just looked back at our data and for example, while the clinical trials report on the right, sort of people reported some incidence of decreased sex drive, lots of sex drive. I got, all, I picked all provocative examples for my talk too. Anyway, so they're all down the right there. We found that in our site, we don't explicitly ask about explicit things, but people spontaneously reported these issues. So we were getting kind of more accurate results just through spontaneous reporting of these patients than they were in these clinical trials where they were explicitly asking about these things. You can see that we're getting kind of a rich data source about these patients. And this is only retrospective. You could just do this in an ad hoc way about all sorts of research questions. Another advantage of an online community is it, it, it's an aggregator of also very rare diseases. So we have these very tiny communities, and we'll look at them and be frustrated. There's a couple hundred people in here. But when we look at a clinical trial, and all the trials that ever have existed are 40 people, all of a sudden, you know, we have this sort of growing base of some, of, of a population that's been otherwise just impossible to tap and no clinical trial center could ever get to. The last example I was going to show you was like one that was, was exciting for us, because we always thought that understanding, say, the efficacy of a new agent was not going to happen for quite a while on our site. But it turned out about a year and a half ago, this little paper came out that said, there's a new treatment for ALS. It might work. ALS is a devastating disease that tends to kill you in three years. So of course, our community was very excited about it. And, uh, and basically, patients started talking about it on our website, and people started going on this drug. It's lithium. It's used you know, pretty widely for psychoactive purposes. So all of a sudden, we had hundreds of patients going on this, this drug. And we built some tools. We spent a few weeks building tools that were appropriate for measuring the blood levels of lithium and, and tracking these people as a group. So way beyond, so clinical trials started recruiting maybe eight months later. We already had findings on hundreds of patients who were on this drug. So it was the first time you have this kind of patient-generated clinical trial occurring in this kind of ad hoc way. And it's not, it doesn't have the same controls as a clinical trial. I'm not going to call it a clinical trial. But it was a trial that was suggestive of a result way above and ahead of any formal inquiry. So that just brings us back to this funny gadget. And in, at Patients Like Me, we're kind of agnostic about what technology we use to collect the data, but rather it's about the patient problem and what are you really trying to solve for the patient. And I would argue that there are certain problems that are very much about our routines, our behaviors. What do we eat each day? How much do we exercise? These are things that make sense to be placed and to do the data analysis at sort of the point in which they're enacted. And there are other times when you might just periodically be reporting about a clinical visit where you know, a website what might be appropriate. So, so as we move into things like diabetes, obesity, this becomes much more relevant. But I also want to stress that, again, the act of recording and the act of contemplating is also a therapeutic intervention and powerful unto itself. Oh. Uh, I just wanted to close with this. 
To listen well is as powerful a means of communication and influence as to talk well, in that I almost see these funny devices as a method for us to be picking up new kinds of information and learning how to interpret it in meaningful ways so that patients in themselves can be learning to make better health decisions and improve their outcomes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jenna. Um, you have even time left, my compliments. Uh, Jonathan. Question over there. How do you know your patients are authentic? Supposing I was paid by a drug company to go onto your site and rig the results. Well, most patients do come in, they put in data over quite a long period of time. And there have been people that are obviously trying to sell things or have an agenda. And it's generally quite obvious to the community and the community, the people who are um, maintaining the communities. It, you, it's also highly illegal. So if we we're ever caught, it would be, it may not, it's probably not worth it. I mean, the things that people do are more like people coming and trying to sell nutraceuticals or pedal thing. I mean, that certainly happens and it's just, dealt with. Yes. yes, I had a question too. First, a big compliment of this good presentation. Thank you. And uh, being American, not talking about how we can make money, triggered the question, uh, what is the business model around? Oh, I know, and I was supposed to talk about that. So, yes. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very, you're a plant. Um, we're actually doing quite well working with drug manufacturers who are very curious in this post-clinical trial assessment of their products and also of other people's products. Another way that we actually, an unexpected sort of venue for us is to understand adverse events associated with these drugs. So there are very few mechanisms to understand ad, you know, things that, uh, unexpected outcomes around these drugs and we have a kind of systematic way to capture those outcomes. And so we're, we are a kind of a data company. We also have explored models which are more embedded with service providers, and those are very promising too, but the data models have been sort of the quickest to flourish, and, we're like their com and once one company agreed to it, it sort of all came down. So it was a, it was a sell to initial pharmaceutical companies, but once one pharmaceutical company is interested, other ones follow. So. It's promising. Let's leave it at that. Thank you again, Jenna. If you want to know more, she's here in Amsterdam for the coming while, so um, you can ask her.